Good morning. If you would, take your Bibles and open them up with me. We're in Exodus chapter 6. And as we left off last week, we have Moses being prepared by God to come and lead the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt and all the way to the promised land. In this, God is preparing Moses all along the way. And we're, we're seeing a showdown that's about to happen. We're going to see some of that today, but more so tomorrow. Uh, this showdown between the gods of Egypt and Yahweh, the one true God. Really, it's a, um, a contrast and a conflict between Satan and God. And there is uh, no worry or no chance that God is not going to win this. Nothing is going to happen that God hasn't ordained and pre-approved. Uh, and so this is all about preparing Moses to be a partner with God and to reveal God loves the nation of Israel. God loves the nation of Egypt. God loves Moses. God loves Pharaoh. And God wants to reveal himself to all parties involved while he judges Satan. I want you to go with me to chapter 12. Chapter 12 and verse 12. It says this, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and it's talking about the last plague here, and I will strike down all the firstborns in the land. We'll get to that both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So all of these plagues are against Satan and the demons. That, and we're gonna, we've already seen how behind these idolatrous gods, they're not really gods at all, they're demons. And God is going to show his control over them. As we left off last time we were together in chapter 5, verse 22, Moses returned to the Lord uh, and said to this people, um, no, Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why? Why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? Uh, not a very good way to come to God. God, why? He, he Pharaoh is really big in his eyes right now. And God is really, really small. And he says, man, I wasn't expecting any trials or any tribulations in this. Why? Why are you allowing them to be enslaved? Well, clearly he's allowing them to be enslaved so that they would not be satisfied to live in the comfort of Egypt for their entire existence. He wants to bring them out, take them to the promised land where they can serve him uh, and not get mixed up with all the idols of Egypt, even though we're going to find out that they they do. Why did you ever send me? Well, back in chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, God already told Moses that Pharaoh, he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh wouldn't listen to him. So I don't really understand how blaming God is going to help the situation. But what we see, remember, it's always about the character of God. And we would think at this point, that God would be pretty tired of Moses. But we don't find that at all. We don't even find God reprimanding Moses. We find God, again, emphasizing what he said, telling him what to do, and expecting him to do it, regardless of how he feels. He says in verse 23, Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Just because God doesn't work on my timetable doesn't mean that God is not working. Remember, you and I do not advise God. He does his will in his time. Our job is to submit to his will and get to know him through the process. Moses is doing that. It's just, it's a hard process. If you are in that at all, you know this for a fact in your own life. So we come to chapter 6. And it's, it's almost as this, back in Exodus chapter 2, uh, verse 24, it says this. Uh, so God heard their groaning. 
And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. Remember, they were crying out. They weren't crying out to God. They were just crying out. God heard them. Now, God has chosen a partner, and God is speaking now. So God heard, now he's speaking, and he's asking everyone else involved, are you ready to listen? And we're going to see that as people don't listen too well, uh, it, he's going to get louder and louder and louder. Um, if we see uh, with Moses, and we're going to see it all in this chapter and in the ones to follow, a good pattern. He's bold in front of the people, uh, but he's broken before the Lord. Um, I think before we even pray, I want to read some to you from Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Uh, remember, Jeremiah is called the, the weeping prophet. Why? Uh, we'll see here. Look at verse 4 of Jeremiah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak. Does that sound familiar? I'm too young. I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. For what? I am with you to deliver you. Sounds just like the Great Commission in Matthew 28. I'm going to be with you while you do what I've told you to do. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down and to destroy, to overthrow, to build and to plant. And the word of the Lord came again to me, saying, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my words to perform it. That's a pretty key point. The word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing from the north. And then he goes to say, hey, there's going to come an enemy from the north. Look down at verse 17. He says, now gird up your loins and arise and speak to them all that I commanded you. Do not be dismayed before them. Or I will, dis I will dismay you before them. So you either tell them what I want you to tell them, or you're going to answer for it. He says, now behold, I have made you today as a fortified city, and as a pillar of iron, and as walls of bronze against the whole land, to the kings of Judah, to its princes, to its priests, to the people of the land, and they will fight against you. But they will not overcome you, for I... Am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. It's the same thing God talking to Jeremiah that he's telling Moses. The only problem is Jeremiah has the example of Moses. Moses doesn't have any of that. So we have to give Moses a little bit of a break. And we see God's patience in all of his dealings with Moses. So if you haven't already read uh, chapter 6, Right now is the time to read it. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word. May it come alive to us today. May it not just be an exercise of religious ritual, but may your word speak to us. First, Father, may it speak to us about who you are. And then reveal to us who we are. So, Father, we need you today, um, and we want to proclaim that openly and often. Help us today, Father, to glorify you through our lives and to enjoy the process. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 1, chapter 6, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, now we, the chapter break is Moses complaining against God, actually even putting some blame on God. and God doesn't even seem to recognize it. He just said, then the Lord said to Moses, now, you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. I'm, I'm going to show you. He says, 
Uh, for under compulsion, he will let you go, and under compulsion, he will drive them out of the land. You're questioning me about this, but let me tell you. Not only is Pharaoh going to let you and all of Israel go, he's going to be driving you out. He's already said all the people are going to be giving you all their valuables, their gold and their silver, just to get you to leave. God spoke further to Moses, verse 2, and said to him, I am the Lord. I am the I am. I am Yahweh. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob as God Almighty. God Almighty is El Shaddai. So, but by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. They knew God Almighty, and they knew the covenant name of God, but God never explained what the word Yahweh meant. The only reason God explained it to Moses is because Moses asked. But think about it. All Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob got from God was promises. Moses comes along 400 plus years later, and he's seeing some of the fulfillment. He won't see all of the fulfillment, but he's seeing the promises of God fulfilled. And so Moses has a close, intimate relationship with God. And we're going to see that as that plays out in here. But right off the bat here, he's, he's reminding him, I'm the one in charge. I'm God. You're not. He says, uh... I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourn. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel. I've heard their groaning. Now I'm speaking and I'm wondering if they're listening. I'm also going to be speaking to you, Moses. Are you listening? I'm also going to be speaking to the Egyptians. Are they listening? I'm also going to be speaking to Pharaoh. Is he listening? Furthermore, I've heard the groanings of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage. I have remembered my covenant. So in answer to chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, God says, I've seen everything that's going on. Just because I'm not acting on your timetable doesn't mean I'm not acting. Say therefore uh, to the sons of Israel, I am Yahweh. And then he's going to give four promises. These promises uh, are in the, in the Passover Seder meal. There's four cups. There's actually five cups that are, are drank in the celebration. Four of those, they, they're all connected with a promise. And four of those promises are found right here. And we're going we're gonna to read them and then we'll review says, I am the Lord, I will bring you out. Out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people. And I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from the burden of burdens of the Egyptians. So one, two, three, four times he uses the covenant name, uh, affirming to them. And first, the first uh, promise, I'm, I'm going to bring you out from this land. Uh, I'm going to, your circumstances are going to change. You're, you're not going to be a slave in the Egypt. Second, though, when he says, I will deliver you from their bondage, there's more to that. I'm, I'm going I'm to bring you out, but I'm also going to set you free. The idea is that, first of all, I'm going to take away your slavery, but just taking away the slavery doesn't take away the slave nature. And we're going to see them for the next 40 years struggle with the slave nature. Of, of being a victim, and it's always bad, and da, 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 I'm powerless in this. Um, third promise, I will redeem you, I will buy you back, and then I will, you'll be my people. 
All of these four are part of the Seder meal, the Passover meal. Remembering Passover. We'll get to Passover on the last plague. The fifth cup is the cup that doesn't come till later. It's called the Elijah cup. It's the cup of God's wrath. This is the cup that Jesus says he, he, um, he's not going to drink until he in the, in the last Passover meal. He says, I'm not going to drink with you. I'm not going to drink that God's going to deliver me because he's not going to deliver me. He's going to drink the wrath. When he's in the garden, he says, let this cup pass from me. He's talking about this fifth cup, this Elijah cup, and he drank the wrath of God uh, when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that's just a connection. F.P. Meyer wrote this, and I think this is um, interesting with the covenant name of God. He writes this, when all human help has failed, and the soul is exhausted and despairing, has given up hope from any man, God draws near, and God says, I am. I am. As we looked at these verses, there's five statements of I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, and God performed every one of them. If you want an interesting exercise, take the I wills from here of God saying I will and then take them to Isaiah 14 verses 13 through 15 where Satan is saying five I wills. And you can see very quickly that the five I wills that God said were all fulfilled. The five I wills that Satan said, none of them will be fulfilled or are fulfilled. And so Satan is a liar. God is God. And, and he, God is showing that very clearly um, here. So I, I want to bring out this aspect. In, in verse 7, it says, Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So remember, God's speaking. He says, I want you to get to know me. Okay, so is God mad at the nation of Israel? Is, is God doing these things against Israel? And clearly the answer is no. We've already seen that God is wanting Moses to get to know him also, all the way back at the burning bush. Now, let's connect this. If you go to chapter 7, verse 5, it says, Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So here's another wrinkle in this. Not only does God want to reveal himself to Moses and to Israel, but also to the Egyptians. Not stopping there. Go to verse 17 of chapter 7. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know. And he's talking to Pharaoh, that I am the Lord. Not only we've got Moses, we've got Israel, We've got Egypt, and we've got Pharaoh. God wants to reveal himself to all of them. God's not upset at any of them. He's upset at the idolatrous uh, gods that are reinforced by the demons of hell. And God's going to judge them. Now, all along the way, all entities involved have an opportunity to either continue in Satan's side or surrender to God's side. And we're going to see varying degrees in all of it. Verse 8. It says, I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you for a possession for, what? Here again, I am the Lord. So Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel. So it seems very simple. God said it, I'm just going to go tell them. And what happens? But they did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and cruel bondage. The word despondency there is the word that means they, they were so burdened by this. 
Uh, discouragement isn't a good word here. Uh, they were so burdened by this, they couldn't take full natural breaths. It was affecting their ability to breathe. Um, let's go on. It says in verse 10, Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Go, go, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of this land. But Moses spoke before the Lord saying, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? For I am unskilled in speech. I think it's interesting here how God, okay, so Israel basically has rejected what M Moses said to them, but it doesn't matter because God's the one doing this. Of course they would reject him because it's causing more pain in their life. They don't have any understanding. They don't know God at all. Moses is just getting to know God, so he's struggling in this also. Go. God's basically saying, uh, ignore your feelings. Ignore the feelings of this nation, because neither one of you really know me. But you're going to get to know me through this process. So ignore your feelings and just do what I've told you to do. And he comes up with a different excuse. Before he said, I was... You know, I'm not a good talker. I'm not eloquent. But here, and the, the New American Standard says unskilled in speech, but really that's not the term here. It's uncircumcised of lips. Basically what he's saying is, and if you go back to chapter 4, verses 24 through 26, Moses got in a lot of trouble for not circumcising his second son. So he wasn't part of the covenant. He was unclean, and God was going to judge him. And what he says basically here is, my lips are unclean. I can't speak your words. And all the focus seems to be on what Moses can do rather than what God has said and what God is doing. Look at verse 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron and gave them charge to the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Look, he says, doesn't even recognize, uh, you would think that another excuse from Moses would get retribution from God, but it doesn't. God, man, you see the loving kindness, the patience of God, the long suffering here, and trying to draw Moses, his partner, in to a closer walk with him. In uh what Moses needs and what all of Israel needs is the same thing that we need. In Romans 12, it says, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies living sacrifices as your reasonable act of worship. Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. God keeps saying the same things over and over and over again to remind them and us. Because when things don't happen on our own timetable, we tend to think that God isn't answering. God is not working, but he clearly is. In 1 Peter chapter 5, um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says this. Well, let's go up to verse 6. It says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, his time. It says, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So in, in the waiting times, go to him, tell him. And guess what we find Moses doing? Going to God, being honest about how he feels. But what we're going to find is that what God has said is going to happen. Um... Let's keep going. Verses 14 all the way to uh, verses uh, 25 give a genealogy. And I think it's very important here that it's here. It's, it goes through Reuben and Simeon and Levi, and then it expands on Levi. Uh, this will become important, the names here. Um, we know that Le Reuben and Simeon, basically their tribes are going to 
dispersed and be, uh, they're going to be absorbed into other, um, other tribes because of the sin that they were involved in uh, with his father, Reuben with his father's wife or concubine, and Simeon with the murder of innocent people. Levi, it says, had three sons, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. These are going to be important names because from them is going to come the Levitical priesthood. Um, so the, you're going to see as the tabernacle is torn down and built, put back up and torn down, they're going to have all different branches of service in uh, the priesthood. So it says Levi lived 137 years. Then it gives his different grandchildren. Um, Amram being the most important. Amram married his father's sister, Jochebed, and we know that that's Moses and Aaron's parents. We've already talked about that. Um, but from Moses uh, there, and Aaron, there comes some very interesting people. Korah was Moses' uncle. Korah is going to become very um, interesting in their time in the wilderness. He's going to lead a rebellion against Moses. And we'll talk more about Korah's rebellion later. Um, it tells that uh, Aaron's wife is Elisheba. She, they had four sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are very going to become very important because we're going to find that Nadab and Abihu were serving in the tabernacle for God, and they don't obey God, and God's going to judge them. And then Eleazar and Ithamar will come from that. So just some important names for the future, so keep them in mind. Look with me at verse 26. It says, it was the same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring out the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their hosts. Uh, they were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the sons of Israel from Egypt. And it was the same Moses and the Aaron. Verse 28. Now it came about on that day, it's going to kind of link back to what was being discussed before the genealogy. Now it came about on that the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I speak to you. But Moses said before the Lord, behold, I am uncircumcised in my lips. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? I think that Moses understands his own inadequacies. He understands, at least in some degree, the scope of the job in front of him. And he's understanding that he cannot do it in his own strength. And I think this is very good things to come to. But what he hasn't really grabbed onto yet, and he will, the power of God. And we're going to see Moses grow in his understanding of the power of God. Here, when I read this, it reminds me a little bit of Isaiah chapter 6. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 6, the call of Isaiah. Um, and, and he says it this way. He says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, and with two they covered his face, and with two covered his feet, and with two they flew. And one called out to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled, at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filled with smoke. How does Isaiah respond? Woe is me, for I am ruined. I am a man of, here we are, uncircumcised lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. 
and now I've seen the king, the Lord of hosts, I'm going to die. But one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, it has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. I want to use your mouth, Isaiah. I want to use Moses' mouth. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Whom will go for us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Then I said, here I am, send me. Again, much like Jeremiah, Isaiah had already the example of Moses. The only example that Moses has is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. He had the promises. But now he's having to walk in faith in the fulfillment and God's timetable of it, which is, in my estimation, much more difficult. And we see God uh, dealing with him all along the way. And it should encourage you and encourage me that God loves Moses, that God loves the nation of Israel, that God loves the, the nation of Egypt, and he loves Pharaoh wants all of them to get to know him. And that's why he's going to go to great supernatural lengths to reveal himself to all parties involved, all the while judging Satan and his demons. And then that leaves all parties involved, even including you and me, of who will we submit to? Who will we get to know? And that really is where the question lies in front of you and in front of me. We have the promises of God, 66 books written by 40 authors over the span of 1,500 years, all pointing to the problem of mankind, and the solution is the Lord Jesus Christ. The question is, have you surrendered to him? Have you surrendered? Have you repented about who you are? Have you been born again? If you have not, today is the day of salvation. It won't get any easier for you to surrender to the Lord than it is today. Oh, it may have been easier 20 years ago, but it won't get any easier than today moving forward. You may say, well, I've already surrendered um, my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've already repented of who I am. Now what? Now we're growing and getting to know him. We're in his word what we're doing right now. We're going to pray and we're going to seek the Lord. We're going to ask him to, to reveal himself through the circumstances, both pleasant and unpleasant. And we're going to get to know him in the process. And through this process, he's going to show us things, deeds, actions, thoughts, motives that are sinful. And then we're going to have to repent of those all along the way. God will humble us. And as he humbles us, then he will exalt us at the proper time. May God honor the reading of his word today, and may we grow from it. Father, we love you. Thank you for Moses. Thank you for Pharaoh. Father, I pray that we are not hardening our own hearts. Father, I want to have a soft heart for you. I want to have ears that hear your word. And I want to be sensitive to it. Help us with this today, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.